Okay, good morning. You can make your ways to Zechariah. Second last minor prophet. We are almost through these books of the minor prophets. We've got two left, so the Zechariah and then Malachi. So Haggai, which is the one we did last, Zechariah and Malachi are the three post-exilic prophets. So they ministered after Israel came back from Babylon. Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries. They knew each other. Um, Zechariah followed Haggai by about a month. So Haggai ministered, I think it was something like four months. Um, he got the, if you remember, he got the people going again with the building of the temple. They had stopped uh, various reasons. There was a lot of pressure from, from the, um, the foreign nations around them, the foreign peoples around them. And then there was political pressure from Persia, from the king. And through the ministry of Haggai and the mercies of God, the people started to rebuild the temple again. Um, and now Zechariah follows him, short on his heels. And um, what we'll see in Zechariah is the people need a lot of encouragement. If you think about their situation, they had just come back from exile. Many of them came back with very little. And they have to rebuild the city, they have to rebuild the temple, they have to reconstruct society. And they were still under the control of Persia, which is a foreign nation. And these people who had come back were very mindful of the promises of God. If you read Isaiah 54 and Isaiah 60 and Jeremiah chapter 30 and you read Ezekiel they had specific promises that said God will create Israel to be a world power. Jeremiah specifically said that when they come back, God will restore them. And now they look around them with all the trials and the hardships and the difficulties that they are facing, you can understand that they were disillusioned and they had become apathetic. And afraid. And they had lost faith. And so these prophets had a task at hand. They had to encourage these people. Now, his, Zechariah's ministry was aimed at restoring confidence in God's faithfulness. And he had to renew the people's hope in God while he also had to secure their obedience. So what he does in the, in, the, in the prophecy, it breaks up into three parts. We're going to deal with it in that way. We will deal with it over three weeks, over the three, uh, not three weeks, over three sermons. So I'll look at a, a part um, at a time with you. But there's three parts to the, to the prophecy. And this is how he uh, encourages the people and he restores their confidence in God's faithfulness. First, he relays the seven visions God gave him. So there's seven visions. That's chapter one, verse, uh, chapter 1 to chapter 6. Those seven visions, as we'll see this morning, is designed at encouraging the people. And it's really God speaking to the nation and telling them, I'm with you in the midst of your trials. And I'm going to fulfill my promises. The second section is chapter 7 and chapter 8, where God speaks to them about the present blessings of obedience and the curses that will follow disobedience. So in other words, there's warnings and encouragements that they needed. So that's the second section. So the first section is, let's, let's cast this into the promises of God. Okay, If you're taking notes... Chapter, the first section is that God deals with the imminent promises, the promises that He's about to fulfill for Israel in, the, in their own time. Chapter 1 to chapter 6. 7 to 8 is the present blessings of God. And then the third section is chapter 9 to 14, which looks at the distant future promises that God will still fulfill. And what you'll see is that is, uh, that last section, that chapter 9 to 14, is a rich section that deals with eschatology. Not only the coming of Christ the first time, but the second time. When He will restore 
the kingdom. So, this morning we're going to study this first section, the imminent promises of God, or the seven visions God gave the prophet to encourage the people. And then what I want to do at the end, so we're just going to walk through these, look at them in their context, and at the end I want to draw out an application. And the application is going to be simple. What can we learn about God from what we see here? What can we learn about God from what we see in how he dealt with this nation in these seven visions? Father, our deepest desire is to know you. Our hunger and thirst for the knowledge of God. Lord, we we desire to, it's like that woman in uh, the Song of Solomon who looks through the lattice. She, She has this longing desire to see her husband to be. And Lord, we are like that. We, we crave to know you. We crave to see the glory of your character, of the beauty of who you are. And we pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts, that through your work in the past, we may behold your beauty, the glory of who you are. And Lord, I pray as we behold it, as you, the Holy Spirit shows us who you are, you will transform us to be like you in every way. You will also, Lord, uh, our prayer is that you will also um, grant us a deepening love for you, a deepening worship of you. And we pray for these things in your name. Amen. Right, so seven visions that God gave the prophet to encourage the people in the midst of their trials. So, read with me. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. This is just the introduction, okay, down to verse 6. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declare the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they didn't listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. So very clearly God is saying, Don't be like the previous generations whom I eventually sent into exile. I'm calling you to repent. Listen. Verse 5, Your fathers, where are they now? And the prophets, do they live forever? Answer, no. But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake you, your fathers? Then they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. First thing they learn is, okay, God does what he says. God does exactly what He says. So here's the first vision. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu, as follows, I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine with red, sorrel, and white horses behind him. Okay, the great thing about prophecy is you really don't know what that means. (laughs) You got these pictures, and okay, well, so what's that? The great thing about Zechariah is he's gonna he's gonna have a a guide that he can ask. Can you tell me what that means? And the guide's gonna tell him. Okay, so we've got we don't have to wonder. I saw at night, and behold, a man was standing on a red uh, with a red horse. Okay, then verse nine. Then he said, I said, my lord. What are these? So he's got an angel. The Lord sent an angel with these visions, and this angel is taking him through. And so he's asking the angel, What are these things? And the angel who was speaking with me said to me, I will show you what these are. So I'm going to declare it to you. Verse 10, And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Now, Notice what is happening here, okay? This is a vision. God is communicating a message through the pictures He's giving the prophet. 
you don't have a deeper meaning in the, you know, some people, if you read the comments, some guys are going, yeah, the red horse and the black horse means this, and they've got all these, you know, things with, you know, the, if it's a red horse, it's a, a horse of war, and it's a black horse, it's a horse of, you know, he's, he brings plague and death and that nonsense. Very clearly, that's not what's going on here. The angel not, doesn't get into the colors and the whatever else. He just says, you know what, these horses that you see, they are the horses that God sends out into the world to patrol. Now, context would be great here. How do you think the kings of Zechariah's time got information? What did they do? They sent out envoys. <laughs> when he looks at this picture, he's going to go, oh, I know what that is. That's reconnaissance. Today we send out drones to do that, right? <laughs> if he was living today, God would have gone, you know, do you see the drones? <laughs> okay. These are the, this is the way the king gets information from what's going on in the world or in his kingdom. These are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So the Lord has sent these angels. Why? This is the way he's getting information. Okay? Why is that important to Zechariah and to the vision? Verse 11. So they answered the angel of the Lord who was, uh, so, excuse me, they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have Patrol the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. Okay. Here's the prophet. He's in Israel. They had just come back from exile. Do you think they have peace? They have quiet? No. They don't have any of that. And so these, these patrolling you know, horsemen go around the world, and they come back with a message. Yeah, the world is at peace. <laughs> okay. The world is the nations around Israel who has caused her all the trouble that she's in right now. And the Israel is going, Lord, look at that. They are all at peace and look at us. Where are you? <laughs> the angel, verse 12, of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with which you have been indignant these 70 years? Because look at what the nations have. They have peace, but yet with us, we don't have peace. And now the Lord answers. So there's no deeper meaning to the horses than just simply God is saying, Hey, I've gone out to patrol and I've now seen what's going on in the world. I know what's going on. I'm involved. The Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words, comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, proclaim, saying, so these are the words the angel heard from God that is now giving to Zechariah and saying, I want you to proclaim these words to the nation. What are they? Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. But I am very angry with the nations who are at ease. Why? Because while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. It's almost as if God is saying, they overdid the punishment. Therefore, thus says the Lord, verse 16, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. A measuring line is just an implement that they use to build, right? Okay? They, they measure stuff with it. It's like a measuring tape that we have today. When God says a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem, He's saying it will be rebuilt. I'm going to see to it. Again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities will overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So what we find in this first vision, we don't have to go very deep into these colors of the horses and you know the meaning of the horses. The angel tells the, the, uh, Zechariah what the horses mean. It's very simple. God knows what's going on in the world. He takes very careful notice of what's going on with Israel and what's going on in the world. 
He's not ignorant. He sees. And now he says that to Israel. I can see you are suffering. I can see you are struggling. I've sent out my patrolling horses and I've got the information back. Okay? I'm not ignorant. I know what's going on. And you know what? I'm with you. This city will be rebuilt. This temple will be rebuilt. He's encouraging them, saying, I am with you. I know what's going on. The picture conveys the idea that God examines and takes notice of what's going on in the world, and Israel is in, a, is in dreadful suffering while those who caused it live in peace. He sees it. And then, in verse 12 to 17, the Lord promises to restore Jerusalem and her prosperity. Second vision. Verse 18. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, they were four horns. And so I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these? What do they represent? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Okay. Horns, if you look at the Old Testament, horns are a symbol of authority, of power. Okay. The angel is clearly saying these horns represent the nation's who sent Israel into exile. Who are we thinking of? Assyria and Babylon. There we go. That's all the horns mean. Okay? There's four horns, so some people would say, okay, every horn has to mean some, some specific nation. Well, I, I, I try to figure out the fourth one. I know that Israel, Assyria was uh, a nation that was involved. Uh, Babylon was. Edom, we know. Remember, uh, was it Amos that was very clear on the evil that Edom did to the, to the Jews when they were taken into exile? I don't know who the fourth one uh, represents. <laughs> very few commentators would uh, say they know, I think, the, the ones I, I read anyway. But these horns are clearly representing the nations who were involved. So what does God say? So I said that to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? And he says, these are the horns which scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Okay. And I said, what are these coming to do, Lord? And he said to me, these are, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. <laughs> What's the picture mean? God is going to send other nations to destroy those. Okay? It's very simple. Who were they? Persia. Persia came in and destroyed Babylon. Okay? Babylon, if you remember, came in and destroyed Assyria. So God used Assyria to judge and discipline the nation of Israel, sent the north into exile, never brought them back. Okay? The south he preserved, but then Babylon rose up as a, as a world power. God used Babylon to destroy Assyria and to send the south into exile. And then he raises up the Medo-Persian Empire, who destroys Babylon, uh, sacks her, takes control of the world, Middle East anyway, and he uses other smaller nations to do the same thing. So what is God saying to the nation of Israel through this? I'm going to punish the people who did this to you. And the wonderful thing about that prophecy is it was being fulfilled in their time. Okay? They could look back and say, hey, do you remember Assyria? They're not there anymore. They're anymore. Babylon? They're not there anymore. God is busy fulfilling this for us. And He will fulfill it to the end. So the first two visions are both very clearly saying, Israel, I know what's going on. I've seen your plight and I'm with you. In fact, I'm going to send nations, these craftsmen, I'm going to send nations to help you. 
And so the Lord promises to raise nations to protect and defend them against their enemies. The third vision, chapter 2. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. Okay, we know this is a tape measure. Okay, this is a truffle and a tape measure. So here's a guy with things you use to build stuff. So I said, what are you going to do? Where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, and said to him, run, speak to that young man. So in other words, the second angel says to the first angel, go back to Zechariah, and say to him, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. What a wonderful promise. Clearly, God is saying to, the, to, the, uh, to Zechariah, I want you to go back to the nation and say to them, this city will be so big, it won't have walls. Okay? It's going to be too big to have walls. Verse 5. Well, let me read verse 4 again. Run, speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. And then verse 6. This is still the same vision. He says to the people who are still Jews, who are still in Babylon, right? So obviously there were a number of Jews who stayed behind. They had businesses and lives there, and they didn't want to come back to Jerusalem. Verse 6. Ho there! Flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. Because I have dispersed you as the, uh, for, for I have dispersed you as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Ho, Zion, escape you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory he has sent me against the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will wave my hand over them so that they will be plundered for their slaves. Then you will know that the Lord has sent me. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become my people. Then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. The Lord will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy nation, excuse me, holy habitation. Again, God says to them, and he's calling the nation, he's calling the Jews back to Jerusalem, right? Flee out of Babylon, because I'm about to destroy her completely. Don't be part of that. I'm warning you, okay? I'm going to send nations against her, and she's going to be destroyed. Don't stay there. Come back home. Not only that, he says. This house of yours will become a glorious place. So God again encourages them to come back, to settle down, to know that He's with them, and that He will build them up. Verse uh, chapter 3, the fourth vision. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So they were two important men in government, in the government during this time. The one was Joshua, who was the high priest. The other was Zerubbabel, who was the governor of Jerusalem, or the governor of Israel. These two men had a mammoth task. On hand, they had to basically oversee the rebuilding of the temple. They had to oversee the the the, the rebuilding of the nation. Okay, not an easy task. And guess what? They need a lot of encouragement. And so God turns in this, these next two visions. He turns to them specifically, and through Zechariah, he talks to Joshua first. He says. So then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. 
Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said to me, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and you will clothe and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So, th- so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments with the angel of the Lord while the angel of the Lord was standing by. <coughs> What a wonderful picture of uh, God is giving Joshua. I've taken care of your sin. I'm now clothing you for your service. Again, God is saying, I've called you. I've prepared you. I've done all of this to you, Joshua. I'm with you. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house, and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. So, this man, Joshua, was very privileged, in this sense, that God was sending a prophecy, a vision, specifically speaking to him, to encourage him to to fulfill his service that he's been called to do. Verse 8, now listen Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed you are men who are a symbol. So pause there for a moment. Now God is speaking to the nation. These prophets, excuse me, not prophets, but priests, the high priests and the men who minister with him. God says, you guys are a symbol. You are standing for something. What is it? For behold, I am going to bring in my servant the branch. Where have we read about the branch before? The branch of Jesse, do you remember from Isaiah? Who is this referring to? To Jesus Christ. Okay? This is a very clear reference to the Messiah. So we know that the high priest was the mediator between God and the nation. And now God says, you are a symbol. You are a pointer to something greater than yourself. To the branch, the Messiah. And God is saying, I am going to bring him in. For behold, verse 9, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. So this reference to the stone is a strange reference. Uh, I think the, the, the NASB, the translation, is not as good as what it could be. It has to do with the stone that the high priest had on his effort. I I don't know where that... uh, Right, so he carried the stone. And on the stone you had the names of of the tribes of Israel inscribed. God is referring to that stone. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, that day when I send the branch... When I take away their iniquity, declares the laws of, of hosts, any, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. What is God saying to them? He's not only encouraged Joshua, but he's saying, Joshua, you know what? You are like a symbol to the people of something that I'm going to do in the future. This ministry of yours is a picture of of the Messiah. And when I send him, I'm going to deal with the iniquity of the nation in one day. And in that day, verse 10, people will be rejoicing. There will be joy so much that people, you know, this picture of sitting under your fig tree and your vine, you know, we're going to feast in that day says God to the nation. That's still to come for you. Vision 
number 6, chapter 4. Excuse me, vision number 5. So we've got first four visions. There's three more left. Yeah? Two. Seven. There's seven visions. Sorry, did I say six in the beginning? There's seven, there's seven visions. Okay, there we go. So there's, I'm correct. Three left. Okay? Vision number five. Chapter four. Then the angel of the Lord, excuse me, then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was, in, who was awakened from his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on the top of it and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. So he sees a lamp and two olive trees somehow connected up to the lamp. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, Lord, what are these? <laughs> I don't understand. I <laughs> don't get it. So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Don't you know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying. Okay. So now God has turned from Joshua, the high priest, to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, <laughs> uh, the governor. I'm speaking to you now. This picture is to encourage you. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So think about this for a moment. Zerubbabel has the job of rebuilding the city. He's got to oversee the whole thing. He's, he, he liaises with, with Persia. He's the guy who, you know, when they sent those letters in, in Haggai... Uh, when the, the nations around him sent letters to frighten Israel, who did they send it to? Zerubbabel. Okay? What is God saying to Zerubbabel? This job you have, not by your strength, but by my strength. I'm going to supply you what you need. What are you, O great mountain? Verse 7, that picture is just, you know, this building project and the, all of the work he had to do must have been a huge mountain in front of him. And God says, what, what is that mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. Again, God is saying to this, this, this uh, Zerubbabel, to this person, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to supply you the strength you need, and all of these problems will become like a plain before you. And he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also, the word of the Lord came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. So in other words, keep going. You're going to see the end. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the land of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which rage to and fro throughout the earth. Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? I still don't understand the whole picture. And I answered the second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? Now we get the full picture of what he's seeing. What he's seeing is a, is a, a, um, a lamp. We know that these lamps that they had worked with olive oil, and so they would put the wicks in the olive oil and light the wicks, and the lamps would feed the wick, right? But here you have two olive trees standing beside the, uh, the, 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 the lamp, and it's literally feeding olive oil into the lamp all the time. So it's got a... It's got a um, uh, a non-ending, never-ending source of olive oil. What a wonderful picture of God saying, when he says, not by might, not by strength, but by my spirit. What is God saying to Zerubbabel? If you look at this picture, I'm going to supply you everything you need. I'm with you. I'm going to be supplying you what you need. Now he goes further to say that these two olive trees actually represent these two men. Okay, let me read that with you. Verse 
13. So he answered me saying, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. So, chapter 3 and chapter 4 are specifically aimed at encouraging these two men, Joshua and Zerubbabel. And God is saying, these are the two anointed men I have chosen for this work. I will be with them. And they are going to fulfill my work, and this, obviously the lamp must represent Israel. Okay? And so God is saying through these pictures, if you were Zerubbabel, okay, what would you have, how would you have felt of, of, about your work after this? I'd have gone, okay, <laughs> let's go to work. We can do this. Okay? We can do this. God is with us. He's going to supply everything we need. Vision 6, chapter 5. Then I lifted up my eyes and, and again, again, and I looked, and behold, there was a flying scroll. So a scroll, we know that that's what they used to write on. We also know that the Old Testament was written on a scroll. Okay? So here's this scroll flying through the air. And I said to me, what do you see? And I answered, well, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and its width is 10 cubits. So this is something like, you know, 19 meters by 24 meters. It's a huge scroll. That's all he's trying to say, okay? I'm seeing a very big scroll flying through the sky. Then he said to me, and now the angel interprets, what is the scroll? This is the curse that is, going to for, that is going forth over the face of the whole land of Israel. Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. What do you think is written on the scroll? The judgments of the covenant. The judgments of the covenant. Where do we read about the curses and the blessings? Right? Deuteronomy 10, chapter 27. When the nation is standing on Mount Ebal and the others on the other mountain, this guy, these guys had to, cry, uh, had to rehearse the curses. If people are disobedient to me, these curses will fall on them. Okay? So I, uh, Zechariah sees this massive scroll f- flying through the sky, and the interpretation of the vision is, on that scroll is written the covenant and the curses of the covenant. And God says it's going to go through the land and it's going to bring that curse on people who persist in their sin. This is the curse that is going to gain forth over the face of the whole land. Surely everyone who steals so for theft, they will be purged away according to the writing on one side. And everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. J- uh, J.E. Smith, who wrote the commentary on the Minor Prophets, says this, The scroll was inscribed on both sides. The one side contained the condemnation of sins against one's fellow man. That's the, the one side that, that condemns people for theft, right? A specific example of such a sin was stealing. Those guilty of violating the Eighth Commandment and similar commands would be cut off from all covenant benefits. The reverse side of the scroll condemned sins against God. Swearing frivolously in God's name is cited as a specific example of such sins. That's the second one where he says, everyone who swears will be purged away. That is obviously uh, committing perjury. Swearing but lying under oath. So in other words, they would swear by the name of God that they are speaking the truth. Put your hand on the Bible kind of thing. Okay? God says people who do that, who lie, I'm going to purge them. What is God saying to them? What am I going to do with you guys? I'm going to deal with your sin. I'm going to deal with your sin. I'm going to purge you from sinning. According to the scroll, these sinners also would be cut off from covenant benefits. 
But then look in verse 5, connected to the flying scroll vision, then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, lift up now your eyes and see what this is going forth. So there's a, a vision connected to the flying scroll vision, right? So he's saying, go outside and look at this other thing I want to show you. And again he said, excuse me, I'm, I'm in chapter, uh, excuse me, I'm in verse 5. Lift up your eyes. I said, verse 6, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. Some of you will have basket there. Okay? Again he said, this is their appearance in all the land. Right? So what was an ephah? It was something that people used for commercial, to, to weigh out commercial, uh, you know, let me, let me say it this way. When you go to the market and you buy uh, wheat, the guy would have an ephah there, which is a standard weight. And he would use the ephah to weigh out the, let's say you said, you know, I want three ephahs of wheat, please. And he would go three ephahs of wheat. And then we know how much you've got. Okay? An ephah was a measuring thing that they used. So the prophet connected to this flying scroll, which had on it, the condemnation for, for swearing and for just basically sinning, breaking the law, doing things that break the law of God. He sees this ephah. And the, the angel says, this is what they look like in all the land. Verse 7, And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Okay. So he's obviously seeing this exaggerated picture, a very big ephah, right? And on top of it, he's got this lead covering. And so the angel lifts up the lead covering and he looks in and what does he see? He says, there's a woman sitting in there. Okay, what does that mean? Then he said, so the, the angel every time interprets the picture. What is this woman sitting in the ephah? This is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the ephah and cast the lead weight on its opening. Okay. The woman represents some kind of wickedness, but it's connected with the ephah. What do you think was going on in the land? When you go to the marketplace, okay, Yo, read with me. I just want you to have a, a picture of what the, what, is, what the prophet is talking about here. It is in um, Amos chapter 8. If you don't know where Amos is, you can wait. I'll read it for you. Um, Amos chapter 8. Yay. I don't know where it is. Amos chapter 8 verse 5. I'm going to start in verse 4. Hear this, you who trample the needy to do away with the humble of the land, saying... When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger and to teat with dishonest scales so as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals and, uh, and that we may sell the, the refuse of the wheat. That was the picture. That's Israel. Even during this time. When you go to the market, man, you know, iemand gaan jou indoen. That's the way things are done these days, you know. In Amos, the, Amos, the prophet was saying, this is what you guys are, are, are like. You, you can't wait for the new moon and the Sabbath to, to be over because during the new moon and the Sabbath, obviously the market was closed. You couldn't do business. And these people wanted to do business because, you know, that's where they make their money. And not only that, they would cheat people. They would have uh, un, un, uh, unbalanced scales and or even a, I, I can't get the right words now, but you get the picture here. Okay? They were cheating people. So here's how God pictures that for them. For, the, for Zechariah. He shows them this massive bush, bushel, puts a woman inside, which represents the wickedness of the nation. Right? At, in their dealings with one another. They were being um, dishonest, stealing from one another. Now, verse 9, I'm back in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 9. Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and there 
two women were coming out with the wind in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heavens. I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where, did, where, where are they taking the ephah now? Then he said to me, to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. Very interesting picture what God is saying here. Shinar was Babylon. The land of Babylon. Where do you th- well, I don't want to say where do you think they learned it, but that's where all of this stuff happens. God is saying, I'm going to purge Israel from that kind of behavior. And you know what? Take it back to where it belongs. To Babylon. There they can make a pedestal for it and worship at the throne of money. It's not going to happen here in Israel. My people will be purged. They will be a holy people. So that fourth, sixth vision is clearly saying he's been, the Lord has been encouraging both the nation and the leaders. And now he's saying to the nation, and you know what, I'm going to purge you. I'm going to cleanse you from your sin. Let's finish with the last one. The seventh vision. Chapter 6. Now I lifted up my eyes again and looked and behold, four chariots were coming forth from between the two mountains and the mountains were bronze mountains. With the first chariot were red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses. And with the fourth chariot, strong dappled horses. Then I spoke and said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these, my Lord? The angel replied to me, These are the four spirits of, the he- of heaven going forth after standing before the Lord of all the earth, and with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north country. Okay, We know that the north country, these are, are referring to the, 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 the nations around Israel, the north country, and with the white ones going forth after them, while the dappled ones go forth to the south country. When the strong ones went out, they were eager to go to patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried out to me and spoke to me saying, see those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. What happened in the land of the north? That's where Israel went for exile. What is God saying? I'm not angry with them anymore. He's using this big picture of all of these red and black and, you know, Colored horses, and don't get all caught up with what do these horses mean. God explains it. These have gone out. You know what? The picture is just saying this. I'm not angry with you anymore. I'm appeased. My anger is done. Verse 8 again, Then he cried out to me and spoke to me, saying, See, those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, Take an offering from the exiles, from Haldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, and you go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, where they have arrived from Babylon. Take silver and gold, make an ornate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Then they uh, then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will, he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two officers. Now the crown will become a reminder in the temple of the Lord to Helam, to Bajah, Jediah and the hen of son of Zephaniah. Those who are far off will come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you and it will take place if you completely obey the Lord your God. This last vision is again saying, I'm not angry anymore. Not only that, Joshua again is, is said to be a symbol, a picture of the one who will come in the future who will bring in peace to this land. So in all of these visions, God has been saying a simple message to the nation. I see 
your plight. I see what's going on, and I'm with you. I am with you. Keep going. You know, in this rebuilding, the door didn't make it easy for them. <laughs> okay? They still had to struggle through, but he was with them. He kept them. He protected them. He provided for them, and they have been rebuilding. So what do we learn about God from all of these things? I think if you look at how he dealt with Israel, what are the two most important things to him? One of it is that they are a holy people, that they are obedient to him. Okay? That's, that's a very important thing to the Lord. And I think you will agree with me that the New Testament very clearly says that's still important to the Lord, that we obey him. That is something that God is super serious about. In fact, when the nation refused to obey him, he eventually sent them into exile. That's the second thing I think we learn from God about him, is that he will do everything that is necessary to help you repent. He sent the nation into exile to do it. And then when he came back, he brought them back, he kept them in that trial, right? And through that trial was working in them to purify them. So, when there is trials in your life, you know, know this. God knows what's going on. He sees. He's not, you know, oblivious to it. He sees and He is with you. He will be with you. And He's going to work in it to purify you. He's got such a wonderful, great goal for you to be like Him. And He will do everything necessary to accomplish that goal. Father, we thank You that You are a Father to us. We see how You have dealt in the past with Your people, that you, when You see them suffering, you, you draw close to us, and You encourage us through Your Word, and through Your promises, and through the Holy Spirit. We thank You for that. We thank You that we can look to You Lord, that um, we can know that in our trials you are not uh, forgetful um, or negligent, but that you are with us, and that you are involved, and that you know what's going on, and that we can pour out our hearts before you. In fact, the Bible says that we should do this, that we should, shouldn't be an- anxious for anything, but in everything, with thanksgiving, pour out all our petitions to you, because you care for us. Lord, we worship you that you are really as good and far better than what we um, uh, can understand. And that you love us with a, a, a pure and a passionate love that cannot wane, that will not fade. And that it is also not dependent on us, Lord, but that you have chosen to love us in spite of ourselves. We worship you, we praise you, O Lord, and I pray that you will be lifted high in our hearts and that you will grant us um, great, grateful hearts that uh, will be constantly in praise of you. Amen.